Let's work on part five of problem three. And <laughs> I've, uh, I've already used up all the space available for part five on part four. So we're, we're actually going to have to move this down somewhere. But um, wh what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm just going to read the problem first. And we'll come back and figure out where we're going to write the problem after I've read it. So using any existing well-known algorithms or data structures, give an efficient algorithm to count the number of inversions that only the first k elements of an array of n elements are involved in. So let, let me draw a little picture here. We have an array of n elements, so there's n of these. And we're interested in only the inversions that the first k of those elements, so there's, there's k of these, only the first k of those elements are involved in. Now, of course, uh, inversions between elements in that highlighted region, those are inversions that the first k elements are involved in. But those first k elements may also be inverted with respect to elements in the unhighlighted portion of the array. What's interesting here is we're not going to do any better than what we've already figured out as a good algorithm for counting the number of inversions inside the highlighted area. But we might be able to do better in terms of counting inversions between the highlighted area and the unhighlighted area in the sense that we do not need to count the inversions that are entirely within the unhighlighted area. So um, let's start by just counting the number of inversions in the highlighted area. So we know we can do this in k log k time with our inversion counting algorithm. So with inversion counting. And furthermore, our inversion counting algorithm, remember, sorts as well. So I'm going to say and sort. So when we're done, we've also got that highlighted area in sorted order, which might be really handy. Now. How can something in the highlighted area participate in an inversion with something that's in the unhighlighted area? Well, if something in the unhighlighted area, like this element right here, if this is larger than something in the unhighlighted, sorry, in the highlighted area, then it's not inverted with respect to that thing in the highlighted area because it's to the right, so it's supposed to be larger. It's only inverted with respect to things in the highlighted area if it's smaller than those things. So what we actually want to do is we want to count up the number of pairs of things in the highlighted area with things in the unhighlighted area where the thing in the highlighted area is larger. And one way of thinking of that is we could say for each element, so for, this is then, for each unhighlighted, element, uh, count the number of larger highlighted elements. OK, so that's what we'd like to do. That's, I mean, that's not necessarily what we'd like to do, actually. I should back off of that. That's one way that we could do this, and maybe it's not the best way. But let's think that through. Uh, given an element in the unhighlighted area, like the one that I went ahead and, and scribbled on here. So given one of those elements, how do we decide how many highlighted elements it is smaller than? Well, that turns out actually to be pretty easy because the highlighted area is already sorted, right? So we can just binary search in the highlighted area to find the index of the last element that's smaller than that scribbled element there. Uh, and then we are easily able to count. Uh, it's, you know, it's k minus that index, or maybe that's off by one, depending on how you do your indexing. But in terms of the amount of time it takes to run, uh, it's that binary search for each of the unhighlighted elements. So in log k time, we're going to be able to get a count of the highlighted elements larger than that scribbled element. So we can do this with binary search. So this is just going to be binary search. Uh, in log k time. And then there are n minus k of these. So overall, then, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this this many times. So we're going to spend k log k plus n minus k times log k. 
and that's k log k plus n log k minus k log k time. Do we really get to cancel out this k log k and this minus k log k? That's a bit of a messy question since we've been talking asymptotics, so there's constants all over the place that I've ignored. But happily, it also turns out not to be an important question. Remember, k is certainly going to be less than or equal to n in this problem. I mean, if k is larger than n, we're asking in an array of n elements, uh, how many inversions are the first two n elements involved in? Well, that would be how many inversions the first n elements are involved in. So anytime k is larger than n, we can just cut k back to n because larger values are not meaningful. So because k is smaller than n, then even if we leave this k log k in, even if we call this n log k plus k log k, n log k dominates k log k. And so n log k plus k log k asymptotically is just n log k. So all of this is an element of uh, O of n log k. So can we do better than n log k? Um, I, I've been kicking around a few ways to do it. Um, I don't see a better way to do it. I suspect there's a nice proof that you can't do it better than n log k under reasonable assumptions like we're only operating on comparisons between elements. I don't have that proof on hand right now, but in the previous problem we already tried working through a bunch of different approaches, so I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on this problem working through many different approaches. We will just stop there.